A year and a half ago, my husband and I were swimming in the warm waters off the coast of West Kalimantan. It had been a good day. I had been working to save lives and rainforest in the nonprofit that we started six years ago at the base of the foothills of Gunung Palung National Park. And as I was swimming, suddenly I was completely overwhelmed with excruciating pain as I struggled to get these coiling tentacles off of me. For eight hours, I was in unbelievable agony as every muscle in my body contracted and I was barely able to breathe. It was a box jellyfish. And box jellyfish have a toxin that is 100 times more powerful than a king cobra. About 50 staff members and friends gathered in the clinic until 3 a.m. that night. We were all certain I was going to die. Thankfully, luckily, obviously, uh, <laughs> I didn't die. But since then, it's been more than a year, and my nervous system is still recovering from the sting. I'm a doctor, and I'm very aware of the fact that we all die. And, and that's OK. But apparently, my time has not been yet, yet come. And I feel like if I have been given that gift, I need to spend my remaining time talking about the things that really matter. The thing that really matters, but we don't like to talk about, is that we are at an unprecedented time in the history of the planet. Massive population growth overuse of resources, and I'm well aware that my own country of origin is by far the worst culprit, and global warming. All of these things threaten all life on Earth. And yet, strangely, I'm starting to have some hope. Why do I have hope? Well, the first reason is that the results of our five-year survey came back to assess the impact of our program. And I'm struck that actually win-win solutions really are possible. The other thing is, as I've been recovering, I've been studying history. And I've been amazed just to see how much humans have changed over time. And that gives me, that encourages me that somehow the 21st century might be, as Bill Plotkin calls it, a great turning rather than a great ending. And finally, I'm finding hope in meeting people all over the world who are striving to make the planet, to find a way for humans to live more in balance with the planet. So I've been thinking about what would need to happen to avert disaster. Well, obviously, some pro problems are global in nature and will require coordination at that level. But most global problems are actually the result of decisions and actions we make at the community and personal level. If we can make our communities more sustainable and healthier, that makes the planet healthier. What we've learned in Kalimantan is that the framing of the problem as the environment versus people is totally wrong. Both can win. And in fact, it is necessary for both to win in order for humans to do well in the long run. Underpinning both the global and the community work is our own personal work. A logger in Kalimantan, I know, told me that he stopped doing illegal logging because he realized he was drilling holes in the bottom of his own boat. I love that metaphor. If a logger in Kalimantan making less than a dollar a day can figure this out and have the courage to change, so should we all. My own journey to understand the interconnectedness of human and environmental health began 19 years ago when I spent a year at that red star studying orangutans. That's Gunung Palung National Park, one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And there, I met a wonderful man who became my husband. And he has supported me financially uh, and emotionally through all of these years of working for free and doing some pretty crazy things. His expertise in tropical ecology has also been essential to our work. Oh, wait, sorry. I do mean the handsome male on the bottom, not the one on the top. <laughs> 
It was said when I first came to Borneo that an orangutan could go from coast to coast on the third largest island in the world without touching the ground. But unfortunately, that is no longer the case. In the time that my husband and I have been going back and forth to Borneo, we have witnessed firsthand the fastest rate of deforestation the world has ever known. In the 1980s, more wood came out of Borneo than from all of South America and Africa combined. It is now estimated that Gunung Palung, where that red arrow is, contains 10% of the world's remaining orangutans. This destruction has been horrible for the planet. It's been horrible for orangutans. But it's also been bad for local people. This fact came out in an interesting technique that we did when we first started. It's very, very simple. Anyone can do this technique anywhere in the world. So first of all, you just simply list the common medical problems. Then you list the causes of those problems. Finally, people draw connections between the illnesses and the causes and amongst causes. The causes with the most number of connections are the critical fulcrums that either make everything better or everything worse. And what we found around Gunung Palung is that these were the critical issues. Poverty, not enough knowledge, lack of access to health care, and environmental destruction, particularly through logging. So all these things are interconnected. Poor people who don't have enough knowledge and who don't have access to health care end up sick or in debt. Then they can't send their children to school, and they can't learn new skills themselves. And then all of that leads to environmental over-exploitation, which just makes the poverty and poor health worse. This is a horrible downward cycle. And this is happening in many places all over the world. This cycle was illustrated for me by the man who owns this rice field. That's him over there on the left. Now, he used to be an illegal logger before he became a farmer. And he says now that he's a farmer, he is so aware of how critical it is to protect the watershed. Without enough water coming down from the mountain, you can't grow rice. And people don't do well without rice. He says, so now he's working really hard on convincing his neighbors to stop logging. He says, but the problem is, what do you do if a child gets sick? Even if the parents know that it's in the long-term best interest of their children for the forest to be there, what choice do they have if they have to log to pay for their child to survive now? I believed that we should try an innovative new approach that would improve health both in the short run and in the long run, where we would be protecting the natural environment and working to make people's lives better. Luckily, a lot of people agreed with me. And together with an amazing team in the United States, we founded the nonprofit Health in Harmony to support the work of the nonprofit that I founded in Indonesia with Hotlan Ompasungu, who's here in the audience tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, she and I founded Alam Sehat Lestari. Both of these programs have done amazingly well over the last um, six years, and we've gone from four to over 90 staff. We've also seen some really dramatic results. In the communities around Gunung Paling, there's been a doubling of average income, although it's still very low at $1.50 a day. In our little clinic, we've had over 34,000 patient visits and trained over 100 healthcare providers. Every indicator we have of the health status of the community has also dramatically improved, including, here's just two examples, an 18% decline in infant mortality and a 49% decline in diarrhea. And I can still barely believe this, but in five years, there has been a 68% decline in logging households. And we have lots of good data from other studies and other ways of looking at this problem to suggest there really has been a dramatic decline in logging. And 41% more children are finishing grade school. So you know, all these things are interconnected. So people, when they're protecting and restoring the environment, learning new skills, and able to do so much more when they're healthy. And that cycle can just keep going up. So the question is, how do we do this, and how do we do it in such a short period of time? Well, the first answer is obviously we didn't do it alone. We worked very closely together with other nonprofits, with the government, with community leaders, and with schools, all of whom have had their own excellent impacts to the communities. But our work has not only been direct, but it's also, we've served as an example. 
the head of the Department of Health told me that until he saw our clinic, he didn't know it was possible to provide high quality health care in a remote place. He said he wasn't even trying. I believe what's made us successful are three key features. Listening, seeking win-win solutions, and working together. When we first began, we said to communities, if the world was willing to work together with you to save some of the last lowland Bornean rainforest, first, would you be interested in a system where you traded rainforest protection for things you need? And if yes, what would you need to stop the logging and to make your lives better? And you know what? They knew what the solutions were. They just didn't have the capacity to make them happen on their own. So this is what they asked for. And these address the root causes, like we looked at before. So first they asked for improved access to health care. That includes ambulance service, mobile clinic visits, and high quality health care in our clinic. The next thing is that we told them that we said, look, of course, no one would ever, we would never deny health care to anyone. Everyone can always access care in our clinic. However, they were delighted that villagers that came from villages that were not logging would get 70% of their bill paid for by donors who wanted to say thank you to them for protecting rainforest. The second thing they asked for was training in organic farming. We were very surprised by this. But in retrospect, it makes sense that they didn't have this knowledge because the traditional form of agriculture is slash and burn. That means you cut down one crop of, of forest, you plant a crop of rice, and then you move on. That system worked well when there was lots of forest and not very many people. But it doesn't work anymore, and they know it. So the second principle is seeking win-win solutions, where both the environment and people benefit. So let me give you an example. In our clinic, care is not free, because we want it to be as sustainable as possible. However, Everyone can always access care in our clinic, no matter how poor, because you can pay with non-cash means. The non-cash means we choose are ones that enhance the environment. For example, people can pay with manure, they always think that's very funny, <laughs> or seedlings, which we use for reforestation, or with beautiful hand-woven mats that we then sell to pay for health care. Or people can work in our organic garden, where they <laughs> learn new skills and they feed the clinic. So. How do you provide high quality health care in a remote place and teach a form of agriculture that is known locally? The answer is you work together. Volunteer specialists from all over the world, villagers from around Gunung Palang, and highly skilled Indonesians all get together and magic happens. Each on their own can't do much, but together they can impact the globe. And the effect extends beyond our program. For example, every young doctor who learns a new skill uses that knowledge to care for patients for the rest of their life. I want to share with you the story of Pat Mustafa Rudin because it illustrates how right the community was in the things they asked for. This is Pat Mustafa Rudin at the first organic farm training. At the second farm training, he looked really sick to me. And at one point, he stood up and he almost passed out. I caught him and found he had a really high fever. We took him to the clinic, and there we heard the most amazing story. Twelve years previously, he had fallen from the top of a coconut tree. He broke his back, and he horribly smashed up his foot. For two years, he couldn't walk, and the infection in his foot never fully healed. For 12 years, he drained pus from his wound. <laughs> and then, every once in a while, the infection would go into his bloodstream, and he would almost die. And that's what was happening now. Luckily, we were able to stabilize him on intravenous antibiotics. And the next morning, I came in to check on him, see how he's doing. And he says to me, I want to go back to the training. I said, what? Are you kidding? You're totally sick. You've got to stay in bed. And he says, no, you don't understand. At that last training, I learned how to make compost, and I doubled my yield for 20th the price it used to cost me. There is no way you are keeping me from going back to that training. So what can we do, right? So we, <laughs> I want you to wants to learn more. So we bundle him up, we send him off. Um, and he 
luckily is now completely cured. We were able to cure, heal his infection. And he's being a very successful organic vegetable farmer, and he's sending uh, all of his children to school. So this model of combining human and environmental health is very exciting to a lot of people. And my co-founder, Hotlin Omposungu, uh, was the first dentist to receive a prestigious Whitley Conservation Award. This is her in London receiving the award from Princess Anne. That's Charles's sister. <laughs> So Health and Harmony plans to replicate the uh, ASRI model around threatened ecosystems throughout the world. The problems in each place will be unique, but the solutions where we approach the problem by listening, working together, and seeking win-win solutions are universal. However, my jellyfish sting has made me look at it on a much bigger scale. And I realized that replication, while certainly a part of the solution, and it may be a critical tool to use around certain key threatened ecosystems around the world, it's not going to change the course of the disaster that our planet is headed for. Truly what we need is for people in every community on Earth following the lead of the villages in Kalimantan and seeking solutions where both the environment and people benefit. It doesn't matter what culture we come from. We all have a common goal and a common task, a healthy planet for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren. If each one of us were to make a commitment in our own soul to work on a community, personal, and global level, we could impact the world. We could change what is happening. The truth is, and it is very hard to believe this, but the future of humanity and countless other species lies in the hands of the people who are alive today. We all have to work on increasing compassion for all life on Earth, recognizing that we are all brothers and sisters, and that we are all dependent on the same ecosystem. And all together, we have to start plugging holes and stop drilling new ones in the bottom of our global boat. <laughs>